Okay, welcome back for another episode of AlphaCast. My name is Mike Winter, and I'm here as always with Dr. Bear Paul Lando. Today we have an episode that is really close to our hearts with guests, special guests David Parker and Don Lester, co-authors of What Really Makes You Ill. Don Lester and Dave Parker have backgrounds in the fields of accountancy and electrical engineering, respectively. These fields both require an aptitude for logic, which proved extremely useful for their investigation that has involved more than 10 years continuous research to find answers to the question, what really makes people ill? Free from the dogma and biases inherent with medical science, their logical approach to investigation allowed an unbiased discovery process to reveal the flaws within the conventional illness and disease mindset that is promulgated by the medical establishment. The results of their investigation are revealed within their book, What Really Makes You Ill, Why Everything You Thought You Knew About Disease Is Wrong. And this book is quite a, a feat and something that um, we're all very proud of in this community. So we thank you, Don and David, for your wonderful work. And uh, we're really excited about diving into this today. Uh, a couple quick notes here. Um, I want to thank everybody who came out to our um, mass meditation last Saturday on Zoom that was run by Dr. Edith Ubuntu Chan. It was a fantastic online event. Uh, it was something that we were really proud of and we want to do more of those. So thank you everybody who joined us on that because it really was a fantastic um, event and we will be doing more of those. Uh, if you are new to Alpha Vedic, you can go to alphavedic.com and find out all about us. Please join us on Telegram, t.me forward slash Alpha Vedic and you can uh, find out more about everything we're doing. Uh, anyways, how are you today, Dr. Lando? I'm doing great today, Michael. Good morning to you, and uh, good evening to our uh, special guest, Don and Dave. So glad to have you here, and thank you for making the time. Uh, I appreciate it so much. And, um, you know, the work you've done is, is just amazingly brilliant. And I, for one, uh, having worked in the trenches for a long time in bioterrain medicine and having to do things a little bit under the radar uh, to escape the, you know, the notice of folks that don't like people that do th things different or don't obey, um, you know, I, I especially appreciate uh, just now that you, with your research, getting uh, truth out that uh, some of us have, you know, been putting into practice for a long time. And, uh, and, and also, you know, if we dared in, in years past, like 30, 40 years ago, uh, you know, talked about some of these concepts that because uh, thankful for your work and, and people like yourself, you're getting this into the mainstream thought patterns now. And, um, you know, in, in times past, uh, you know, people just thought we were loony bins if, uh, if we talked about truth and logic. So uh, thanks so much, and, and it's just very gratifying to see the truth come out with, uh, with your wonderful research. So, um, you know, after working for so many years uh, doing what I do, I've, I've concluded a few things, which uh, uh, namely um, contagions aren't contagions, uh, pathogens aren't pathogens, disease isn't disease, and cancer isn't cancer. So uh, I don't want to put you on the spot right off the bat, but what say you? Well, yeah, we, we would agree with all of that, but uh, that would be a very short answer if we left it at that. So uh, it probably requires a little bit more explanation. Um, so, but yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, I mean, it took us 10 years to sort of convince ourselves about those things. Um, but we wanted to be meticulous because uh, one is because we're not from the medical establishment, but we feel that that gave us an advantage because we just use logic and we're determined to ask whatever questions to find the truth, you know, to, to make sure what really made people ill and uh, not to take any sort of um, prisoners along the way, as it were. You know, we could ask the questions that sort of doctors in the mainstream couldn't ask, you know, well, not if they wanted to keep their job anyway. So, you know, we, we could ask anything. We could ask, we didn't mind if we seemed to be asking stupid questions. We just asked the questions and... Uh, look for the evidence we just followed the evidence and uh, yeah it took us 10 years but that's what made the nearly 800 page book um, so it is a bit of a tome but we tried very hard to write it so that uh, people could 
you know, layman, if you like, and I'm not being derogatory there, where ordinary people could read it and understand it and know that um, exactly what you, you, you said, Bear, that, uh, you know, you don't have to be scared of cancer on all of these things that the medical establishment has scared everyone with uh, for decades. Um, there's a different way and um, people can live healthy lives and um, yeah even if they have things uh, I think I heard you say once uh, Bear that uh, in your experience you'd found um, I guess from autopsy reports that uh, people had got lesions uh, where they'd obviously had uh, cancers and never even knew about it and then the cancers had healed and you know we found this sort of thing too uh, you know, and you, we could probably say that um, everyone, probably everyone in their life at some time has uh, a, a cancer or certainly could have without even knowing about it. The big problem is if you go to the medical establishment and get them to start treating you for it. And that's when the problems start, because as we all know, chemotherapy and radiotherapy and all the rest of it, uh, you know, as Dawn and I often say, you know, you can't poison a body back to health. You know, it's as simple as that. And of course, those things are extremely toxic, as as are all pharmaceutical procedures and medicines. So, um, but having said all that, um, to be healthy <clears throat> is quite simple, really. There are a few simple rules to it. And as we often say, it, to be healthy is simple, but the rules are strict. You know, you can't mess around with them, uh, nor, nor do you need to. You know, you don't have to just eat boring food. Um, we, do, we do recommend a plant-based diet. I mean, Dawn and I are both vegetarians. Um, well, vegans really, but, um, you know, we do recommend a plant-based diet and uh, we do recommend organic food. Um, and we explain the reasons for that in the book, you know, and we can go into them. Uh, uh, well, I say it's this, e this evening for us, but of course it's not for you. Um, we can go into those reasons in more depth if you wish. But as uh, as you were saying, you know, um, cancer isn't cancer. A, a lot of the problems with the medical establishment is um, is all the labels that they put on everything. They call um, different conditions by different names and everyone gets fixated on those names and thinks that that's something unique. These are unique conditions. They've got unique symptoms. Therefore, if you've got X, Y, Z symptoms, you've got this disease and that's a label. And so many people get so drawn into that. And if you like, sometimes own it to the point where they can't see beyond it. They can't see that there's there's something to do about it and so uh, it can be very very difficult to get people out of these belief systems but again it's the um, you know it's the authority of the white coats the, the qualifications all the years of, of learning and, and studying that doctors go through of course that um, and then everyone then believes that that's that's how things really are. And so that's why it took us such a long time. And we kept digging, kept asking questions because we wanted to say, we kept thinking, well, how can this be? Um, um, but if this is the case, then what about? So we looked at something else and then, well, what about? And that took us down all sorts of rabbit holes. And, and in the end, we realized, you know, what the medical establishment are saying about diseases about health well they don't know about health they, they only know about disease and so you know we had to look at well okay what's health then so you know we had to start from a completely different angle so we start, instead of coming in from what's disease we say well actually what's health what actually is the human body what does it do and we found that it's actually got far more abilities um, than it's ever given credit for certainly through the establishment that uh, you know the body can heal itself the body can do all it's, it's it's an amazing organism and has got far more abilities than is given credit for so yeah I'm, that's I'm, that was the the main kind of main thing that we we discovered i'm, yeah, I'm going Revelation. to yeah i'm <laughs> i'm going to just uh, say a little quote that's on the back of our book because it's, it's obviously a favorite of ours and I think it sums up the medical establishment so I hope I'm not offending anyone out there but then I'm going to say it anyway uh, but it's it's by Voltaire so it's going back a few years but he said doctors are men who prescribe medicines of which they know little to cure diseases of which they know less in human beings of whom they know nothing 
and I think that <laughs> really <laughs> sums it up. Um, it might be quite extreme, but it's it's pretty. No, I mean that goes way back. That's what's great about your book too, is you track you track the history of medicine all the way back to Greek times and, and prior, and and seeing how really the reductionism started a long, long time ago, which is something I talk about a lot, reducing man to chemicals and to a machine. And it's this foundation that modern medicine is based on um, that is, we're still at today. And it's really fascinating. Um, you know, one thing we talk about in, you know, in terms of understanding health is this notion that modern medicine is the new scientific based medicine. It's the, it's the final frontier of where we are, even though we're seeing chronic disease everywhere and, and you know, life spans dropping. Um, but I'm, I'm always curious because you guys have done so much research into the history. You know, there's this idea that, you know, 100, 150 years ago, people were dying left and right from disease. And we weren't, our nat in other words, the idea is our natural state is not to be healthy, that we're always fighting against something. And that um, really, thanks to modern science and modern medicine, we are now living longer and we have better lives. But I really feel like that's a fallacy. And I feel like there's a lot of tricks at play. Um, in terms of reshaping history and reshaping our, our idea of what it was like in the past to be human. Uh, would you guys say that's true, a true statement? Uh, yes. Um, and that's one of the reasons we, we look back in history to see if there were different times and what was happening. But we found that uh, um, you probably hit on a point there about history. As, uh, you know, they often say uh, history is written by the winners. And... Uh, and that's very true, and it's very true about uh, anything to do with medical history too. Um, so lots of things have been glossed over. I mean, as we know, Louis Pasteur is held up as some sort of hero, but if you look into the things that he did, um, people are starting to realize now that not only was his um, uh, discoveries really fraudulent, but uh, actually caused a lot of harm. But, uh, um, and, uh, but it became convenient for uh, what's now the pharmaceutical company to latch on to the beginnings of the germ theory, if you like, and it, it still is a theory. And our book shows that it's uh, an unproved theory and has no basis in science whatsoever. Um, no. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that if you just uh, took at face value what the establishment tells you. I mean, there's the Louis Pasteur Institute. I mean, it's a big thing in, in, in France, isn't it? You know, so it, it looks like it, he's some sort of hero, and everything he did was really good, and a savior of mankind. And nothing could be further from the truth. Um, and the sort of findings of uh, Pasteur um, have been really of great damage to uh, humanity, and uh, and are still being uh, doing great damage to humanity. And it's this sort of reasoning that uh, we came across time and time again. And, uh, and why we wrote the book, uh, because when we started uh, <laughs> over 10 years ago, uh, when we were finding certain anomalies that just didn't make any sense to us about what we were taught in school, whether it was uh, about vaccinations, you know, we we're taught that they conferred immunity and uh, were good things. Um, but we found exactly the opposite. And uh, we were taught the germ theory uh, and that, you know, uh, bacteria and viruses and fungi make you ill and all diseases or the majority of diseases are, are caused by those we found that that was not true either so th these were great shocks to us but uh, we pressed on with our research to see well can this really be true i mean one of the very first uh, diseases that we looked at was uh, hiv aids which i'm sure everyone's familiar with and um we we didn't really realize i mean we're old enough to know how it all came about in the 80s and uh, scared the life out of everyone. You know, everyone thought they'd never be able to have sex again um, because we were told it was, uh, you know, that uh, whether you were homosexual or heterosexual, no one was going to be safe. And this yeah. disease was going to sweep the world and tens of millions would die. Well, of course, none of that came to pass. I'm glad I to th say. I think Oprah said something like half the world or, or she said some crazy thing where how many people were going to die. Yeah. And, and of course, we see in, you know, there's some good parallels between that from the 80s and what's going off with this uh, coronavirus nonsense uh, today, you know, with all sorts of predictions about what's going to happen. Um, again, none of which is based in science. And again, we can talk about some of the details of that 
as well, if you wish. Um, I know I've mentioned that word, coronavirus. So I'm hoping that that's okay because uh, some hosts uh, have certain taboo words which uh, they say, no, don't say that word because we'll get taken off the air or I'll use my, I'll lose my YouTube channel. And we, obviously we don't want that to happen. So please tell us if there's certain things that you'd rather we didn't say. Uh, oh, coronavirus, just... coronavirus, coronavirus, coronavirus. <laughs> okay. yeah, there we go. It's out in the open. <laughs> okay, no, that's fine. Just, okay. just so well, we know. <laughs> well, we're... But there are great parallels. I mean, with uh, certainly with all the tests, and I know you covered that with David Crow, so we won't kind of really go into that because he, he did such a good job of showing how uh, nonsensical the tests are. They're, they're utterly meaningless, whether they're positive or negative. It's you know they're all false results because they're based. They're not based on anything um, that's. Uh, genuine, uh, a genuine sort of particle, viral particle, or anything to do with anything that's going to make people ill. So it, it doesn't, it, it you know, it is meaningless. Um, and again, same thing with the HIV test that they were um, detecting particles or proteins or whatever it was that are supposed to be specific to HIV, and and yet they're not. And so many test results, uh, well, false positives are uh, related to uh, pregnancy. So. Um, that's one of, uh, you know, that shows it's got nothing to do with ill health, you know, because pregnancy is, is a natural process. It's, you know, absolutely one of the most uh, sort of natural processes, if you like. And the fact that that can give rise to a positive HIV test is, is absolutely astounding. So, uh, but of course, it's very frightening because in, um, you know, in African countries and, and various other sort of uh, und, uh, you know, undeveloped or developing countries, or uh, you know, those sorts of third world countries, that they going in and, and testing, um, testing mainly in uh, antenatal clinics. So of course they're going to get loads of um, false, well, positives, but false positives, and they extrapolate that into the whole um, population. Then they come up with huge numbers of people who are, although they don't call it HIV positive anymore, they've they've changed the language. They're now living with HIV, so it's but people believe it. They absolutely believe it. And, and it's just horrifying. What I seem to have observed is a pattern developing here. It seems like whether you're looking at social issues, uh, medical issues, or anything we can think of, first, you have to have a patsy, okay? You have to have somebody to blame it on. And uh, medicine is, uh, they're very masterful at that. You know, you, I, I, there's so many examples of how they have a theory and then they link something to the theory and then they say, oh, that proves the theory, even though the thing they link, they're using it to prove as a theory in and of itself. You take um, PSA, prostate uh, specific uh, antigen. Uh, well, what we know for a fact, and even within the scientific community, and I'll lose that, use that term loosely, um, it, the, it's, it's made by the liver, it's made by the prostate, it's made by breast, it's made by the salivary glands, glands. So right off you say, well, it's not specific to prostate then. And then we also know other reasons uh, that have nothing to do with what we think of the cancer theory that, uh, you know, elevate it and it's nothing to be afraid of. They do that with uh, viruses and antibodies and, and, and all this corona garbage where they have these polymer chain reaction tests and it, it you know it's all none of it would hold up in the court of law it's all circumstantial and not even circumstantially that brilliant it's just it's just grabbing at straws and trying to you know throw it all up on the wall and see what sticks yeah and, and then this, you know one one other comment i'll just say is you guys have probably done more research than me now i've done you know my share of academics but what i've spent my time doing over the years is actually working on real people and the tools i use are physical exam looking at things under the microscope uh looking at lab results uh, doing instrumentation tests and then uh you know understanding how to manage the bioelectric terrain through those findings which has nothing to do with pathogens disease cancer and everything and, and then you notice that people keep getting better from incurable situations. So maybe what I, my experience wouldn't hold up in the scientific community, or maybe it isn't written in a book somewhere, but, uh, you know, I, I'm a farmer too, and, you know, things grow or they don't grow. So I'm a very practical man, and, 
all I can say is, you know, isn't a scientist supposed to be somebody that just sits back and impartially observes what happens and then you just record it and then that's how you learn? So mm -hmm. clinician, farming, you name it, that's what you do. But somehow um, medicine has just deviated so dramatically that, uh, you know, how can we even call it science anymore? Well, it, it isn't. And um, that's one of the big shocks to us, uh, you know, because they, they always crow that it is science, that everything's science-based, but, it, but it's not. And that was the, one of the biggest shocks for us. And uh, one of our sort of past heroes was uh, Dr. Mendelssohn, um, who uh, wrote, I think he wrote a book, what was your remember? Uh, <laughs> Confessions of a Medical Heretic. A Medical Heretic. And Isn't that's it the lovely? first book I... I was just about to vaccinate my firstborn. You know, he was in the womb. I was in a chiropractic office. Now I was working in emergency medicine and just thought, oh, I'll try a chiropractic chiropractor for my old sh football shoulder injury. I'm uh, in there. I pick up this book and I'm like, my God, my God, can this be true? So then I, one thing led to another and I ended up not vaccinating my kids. So uh, Harold Mendelssohn, I think it was, uh, could get Robert. the wrong... Robert, Robert Mendelssohn, I think. Oh, Robert. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I owe a debt of gratitude for to him for writing that book. And just like your book, uh, you are, say, in my opinion, you are improving the quality of people's lives and saving more lives than probably any doctor on the planet just by getting the truth out. So that's why I'm so appreciative of your work. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I mean, amongst all the other doctors, I mean, we did um, use... Uh, the information from doctors and scientists where we could because obviously we wanted something to substantiate what we were saying um, uh, not that there were a lot of medical doctors but one in particular again you saying like with you say what you say that people's experience of what they're actually doing with real people in the real world is far more important or relevant to real human health than what's going on in some kind of laboratory in a in a petri dish in you know um in labs you know people with lab coats and one of the doctors um john tilden said that he started off working as a um proper let's say you know um official sort of medical system and he worked for 25 years using um you know pharmaceutical drugs uh, and then he changed his practice and he stopped using them and uh, he, he saw an amazing difference in his patient's health. I mean, he, he took them off drugs, but he also gave them advice to change diets and those kinds of ideas. So they're early natural hygiene ideas, if you like. And then that was sort of, um, so, I mean, he died in 1941. So he was practicing a long time ago. Unfortunately, the natural hygiene kind of ideas haven't taken off in the way that they should have done. But obviously there are people like you practicing who are practicing that kind of idea of, of treating the human body, looking at what they do in their lives, their whole, um, everything that they do, you know, their, um, holistic their approach, diet, yeah, it's a completely holistic approach, you know, their diet, but not just their diet. I mean, everything that they're exposed to, but also looking at the fact that the body is an electrical system, not just a chemical. It's not just the bag of chemicals that you just add a few and, you know, mix it up and they'll, they'll come up with the right kind of mix. It's, you know, it's an electrical system and obviously the brain and the heart being two of the most Major important. Major, organs, yeah. yeah. And so it's, you know, it's, um, it's so important that people understand that electrical aspect because that then goes on to explain why electrical interferences in the environment are affecting people's um, lives, affecting their health in a, in a negative way. So it's, it's just all of, all of that. I'm, su I'm sure that uh, although we, we talk about uh, electrical systems, EMFs in our book, but uh, we often recommend to people because there's a, a relatively new book, which probably I'm sure you know about, called The Invisible Rainbow. And um, oh, yeah. it's, it's written by well, a guy that was trained as a doctor who's also an electrical engineer. So he's got, uh, but he's also someone who's particularly electrically sensitive, which is a term which I hate because it just means you're made ill by electrical things, really. Uh, and it should be recognized for, for the real damage that it causes, you know, whether it's neurological, you know, heart attacks. Um, you know, brain tumors, all sorts of things. There's lots of good case studies to show just how uh, dangerous uh, EMFs are. And of course, it's all getting worse um, as we 
are all subjected to more and more of this, um, the EMFs, and particularly with the launch of more satellites by uh, Mr. Elon Musk, who's wanted to put thousands of them up there, uh, irradiate us even more, so there'll be literally no place to hide. And again, we can we can talk about that later. But um, what I was going to say about uh, Dr. Robert Mendelssohn is, you know, I think he summed it up in, in his book where he talked about uh, the medical system as uh, being more akin to a religion than a science, you know, because the majority of it is uh, it's based on assumptions. Uh, it's not based on science. So it's based on belief. And uh, he always said that if you ask why often enough, you'll eventually get to that chasm of belief because there's no science there. And uh, uh, we, we've held to that and we've just kept asking uh, why. Uh, most <laughs> annoying to a lot of people, but you do eventually get to the truth and realize that for all the blather that you may be given to start with, that they don't actually know. And we point this out uh, many times in the book where uh, we've used the WHO and the CDC and all their own sort of papers when the sporty pages of citations at the end of our book so you can people can see where we've got this information from all the scientific papers and reviews and things um you know it's not just our opinion and we point out the contradictions between all these major groups that um i'll tell you one thing in one paper and then contradict themselves in another um which just goes to show that they it's not based on science it's based on dogma and uh, it's based on um largely vested interests which again is a section in the book that we talk about so that we can tie it all together where not only do we strive to show that the germ theory is a fallacy and that the real cause of diseases are, are many and varied um, but of, there's much more probable causes and as Dawn alluded to earlier there are not lots of diseases they're just lots of symptoms which are caused by um, certain factors in in life and we uh detail what those factors are which are few in number really we boil it down to about four different factors which are and one of them is the electromagnetic radiation the two is uh, toxicity the third is lack of nutrition and the fourth is prolonged emotional stress and those things and we talk about how those mechanisms work in the body but all illnesses if you like um stem from those a mix of those four things in one way or another um so yeah. it's yeah so, sorry <laughs> no i was just going to say it's always a complex mix of them all it's never people search for you know well if it's not a germ what is it that causes xyz disease and this i think is another problem with people's thinking people keep asking us this question well if it's not a germ what causes this and it's always a complex mix and it, it seems like um i don't know it's, it's sort of a bit of a cop out when we say well it'll, it'll be different for different people but that that has to be the case because of the actual causes you know they will be different people are exposed to um uh, all kinds of different things in their environment and they have different diets and so it's always a complex mix including the the stress factor which is which includes fear so it includes people who are now extremely fearful, um, particularly at the moment, and walking around in masks, that is actually adding to their um, ill health problems or will give them ill health problems because, um, you know, they're, they're not good for you, but they're doing it out of fear because they've been made to fear some non-existent particle so, uh, or non-existent germ. Um, it's just, um, it's, it's so upsetting to, to see that. And of course, to see people living in this fear and that can be really damaging to health. I mean, we always, yeah, and when, sorry, when people ask us these questions about, well, what causes this disease then, or what causes that disease? We, we say, well, you know, without wanting to keep repeating ourselves that we do answer these questions in the book. Um, but we say, just look at the, the basic things, you know, if, if it's going to be a virus, we'll say, um, you've got to look to see whether the basic testing has been done, you know, whether they've actually isolated the virus, you know, purified it, whether they've fully uh, characterized it and detailed its full genetic makeup. And where is the test that proves that that particular virus is the sole cause of the, the particular disease being attributed to it? 
you know, simple things really, which you would think would be carried out every time, but they're not. And the coronavirus is no different. Those tests have never been done. And we openly challenge uh, anyone to point us at those papers, uh, as we've openly challenged people to point us at those papers for any virus, um, because it's never been done. And uh, I'm sure everyone's heard of Stefan Lenker, who, uh, Dr. Stefan Lenker, the German, well, he was a virologist, but uh, as he quite rightly says, you know, he so, so became so disgusted with um, the procedures, shall we say, of virology, that it was, uh, it was bankrupt, you know, it was uh, bankrupt procedures. And he's openly said that he, he and his team never found any virus to be the cause of any disease. And so, uh, you know, I think that uh, says it all. And he actually, you probably know that he, he took um, a stance in the courts in Germany and uh, challenged the medical establishment to prove uh, that a virus caused measles. And um, they, there was a couple of court cases, they threw all the big guns at it because he offered quite a lot of money as a reward if they could do it. I think it was about 100,000 euros, so quite a lot of money. Uh, if they could prove a virus caused measles. And uh, eventually they lost their case. And this was in the Supreme Court in Germany. They, they, they lost their case. They couldn't prove that a virus caused measles. So, you know, that begs the question, well, what's the vaccinations all about? But what made it really worse, even though he'd won that case, and this was a couple of years ago, in March of this year, uh, the medical establishment in Germany have got the courts to mandate that all school children should be vaccinated against measles. So that just beggars belief, really, that in their own Supreme Court, they prove there is no virus, and therefore the vaccinations are completely useless and unfounded, and then they mandate that the children are gonna be vaccinated anyway, which shows that the whole system is corrupt and is certainly not based on science. It's just it's... based on vested interests. And I think that was a prime example and that this is only in the last year or two. Wow. Yeah, I mean, you know, really what we're dealing with is, like you said, the new religion of scientism. And uh, we are basically, it's just like uh, the Catholic Church, which reigned over humanity for a thousand years. Physicians have taken the place, uh, this I'm reading from an article here from um, uh, Oliver, Olivia Clerk, and this is brilliant right here. Physicians have taken the place of priests. Vaccination plays the same initi initiatory role as baptism and is accompanied by the same threats and fears. The search for health has replaced the quest for salvation. The fight against disease has replaced the fight against sin. Eradication of viruses has taken the place of exercising demons. The hope of physical immortality, cloning, genetic engineering has been substituted for the hope of eternal life. Pills have replaced the sacrament of bread and wine. Donations to cancer research take precedence over donations to the church. A hypothetical universal vaccine could save humanity from all its illness as the savior has saved the world from all its sins. And it just goes down the line. It's yeah. really wild. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, well, you know. yeah, I like it. I mean, I'd agree with all of that. <laughs> but yeah, the medical model is, is a warfare model. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, from my perspective, when I see countless cases of people coming in diagnosed, say, with a viral condition, say, hep C or something, and, you know, they have their antigen titers up, so, which supposedly proves that they have hep C, and they do have some liver symptoms and things, but then, you know, we treat. And the symptoms go to away, go away. People regain their health. They go back, and uh, you know the antigen titers are, can sometimes still be elevated. So it's like you know, and then people a lot of times they say, "Well, I'm better. I'm healthy, but I'm still concerned because I've got this positive test." And I'm saying, "You really don't have a positive test. That's something else," and uh, and it's really irrelevant to your health. And, you know, you mentioned before about labels and the truth is really been obfuscated by the science of labeling. <laughs> and, um, you know, everything has a name attached to it. And not only as you rightfully pointed out, does that get attached to your psyche and now that's your little pet and you own it. And, you know, that becomes incorporated into your persona, which, you know, if we want to get into other levels of our consciousness that puts everything, you know, into play in our world and our bodies in the first place, then we realize there's no way that that can't 
not happen, you know, if we dwell on it with enough intensity over time. And I can't tell you how many people that were perfectly healthy, you know, one day and going for their routine checkup and they find something and then two weeks later, they're, they're going down the drain, you know, because the white coat uh, tells them that, uh, you know, they have this incurable condition. And mm. so if I think about other cultures, and I always like to bring up the example of the voodoo culture, now that's documented that people within that belief system respond by getting sick and dying. Yeah. And so what is the difference? Please, mm. if you can set me right, what's the difference between a white coat, a high priest saying, you have this, and then somebody's health just going plummeting. And yeah. Every label that we learn in medicine or just as lay people uh, pertaining to our health, like symptoms, we have to throw everything out. Symptoms are not symptoms. They are responses. The body is always responding in a purposeful, intelligent way. And if you understand what it's telling you and why it's doing that, you work with it and the body no longer has to respond in that way. And we could go down the whole list of the taxonomy of, uh, of medical terminologies and disprove every single one of them, but that's the illusion that we find ourselves in now. Uh, the question I'd like to ask you, because, it, and it's very uh, uh, you know, logical that people would ask these questions. You know, They'll listen to Mike and myself and the guests we have on, and they'll say, well, you know, that sounds kind of interesting, but what about rabies? What about, and they go right down the list of all these contagions and, and how, um, well, you know, I was with this guy and I got his sore throat and how did that happen? And so uh, please take yeah. it away. See if you can help me out on that one. Cause I have a hard time explaining that to people. Yeah, we get a lot of those questions, but we did, um, we did try and cover as many as we could because we kept asking the same questions in our heads, kind of, well, if that's the case, then what about? Um, so, yes, we, we did dig into quite a few, not every disease, because apparently there are thousands of them, um, but enough of the what you might call main disease, well, we tried to cover as many of the main diseases as we could. So and we and we did. You mentioned rabies, and we can talk about that in a moment. And uh, one or two uh, sort of more unusual things. But we sort of start by telling people, well, you know, the basis for the germ theory is a fallacy. You know, it's not been proved that there is a virus or a bacteria that causes any disease. So, so you have to start from there. So we're not denying that people get ill, but what we are saying is not a virus or a bacteria that's made them ill. So it's something else, and that's what we did. And then we looked at uh, those particular things, and rabies was one of them, malaria was another, uh, and various STDs, because these were things that people experience and uh, want to know about, so we can talk about them. But we also looked at um, disease in, or so-called diseases in animals. We thought, well, you know, if this germ theory is uh, a failure for humans, it's got to be a failure for animals as well. So what is it? Why do animals get ill? Uh, because, you know, um, it can't be, we thought, it can't be because of what they're thinking. And I agree with you entirely. We can come back to the uh, placebo effect because it's, you know, your mind is very important as to, to your health. And we can come back to that. But we thought, well, let's look at animals because the placebo effect can't be at play here. You know, if... Um, we, we had a thing in the UK, uh, which people commonly call uh, mad cow disease. I don't think it affected anywhere else like it did in the UK. And so we thought, well, let's have a look at that. Uh, there's all these cows going apparently mad and being slaughtered. Well, what, what, what could it be? What is it, you know, we've been told they're catching some disease, um, but why is it really only prevalent in the UK and nowhere else? And, uh, and what disease is it? What, what is it? So anyway, cutting a long story short, because we did quite a lot of work on it, uh, we found out again, of course, it was nothing to do with a bacteria or a virus. What was happening and why it was peculiar to the UK is the UK government and the veterinary surgery, surgeons uh, in association with them insist on farmers dipping their cattle in, cert in a, a certain, like a sheep dip, a cattle dip. Um, purportedly, to kill warble fly, 
which is an insect that sort of bores holes in the hide and therefore the hide of the cow is not as uh, valuable when they come to sell it. So that was the, but what we found was happening is the actual mix, which was organophosphates, was several times higher than anywhere else in the world. I can't remember whether it was three or four times higher. It was extremely high. And of course, organophosphates is uh, uh, toxic to the neural system. And um, that was what was seeping into the cows and poisoning them neurologically, if you like, and giving the appearance of going mad. You know, they couldn't stand up, they were falling about. And uh, so that's what it was. So it was a, a natural thing. But of course, the government's never admitted to that. They have been challenged on it. And uh, there was one farmer who had a pedigree herd, whose name Dawn will probably remember an icon. Mark Purdy. Mark Purdy? Yeah, that was Mark the book. Mark Purdy. Yeah. And he wrote a book about how he protected his pedigree herd against the government. He refused to do this dipping. And his herd was always perfectly healthy. Um, so he looked into it as well to find out. And it was from a lot of his work. Um, unfortunately, he died rather early. One of these people who were, uh, when you challenge the government, you know, you, you die in your 50s rather than a ripe old age. But uh, anyway, that's another story. But, um, uh, but that's what we found. Anyway, can a long story short, it was nothing to do with viruses, nothing to do with bacteria. It was all to do with the government system of poisoning the cattle. And thousands and thousands of cattle were destroyed completely pointlessly um, because of their mistakes. But they tried to create some new... Uh, infectious agent that they called a prion. Um, I have yep. no idea if anything ever was sort of, you know, investigated properly or studied, but they discovered some new, it was some new particle and they call it an infectious agent because it suits their purpose and they really don't want people to know it's something to do with the organophosphates that they're, um, um, the organophosphate wash that they're putting over the necks of their cattle to uh, you know protect them and of course that's seeping into their brains and so yes we looked at various uh, animal diseases to see and as i say again we, we discussed these in the book but uh, it, it the same thing proved true that in none of the things whether it was as you say mad cow disease or uh, myxomatosis in rabbits we, we looked at all sorts of things and found that what we were discovering was true for animals as it is for humans. There is no truly scientific evidence to prove that either a virus or a bacteria was the cause of the illnesses. It was, if you like, it was stuff that mankind was doing with uh, poisoning the landscape, poisoning the animals, um, and then um, blaming it on something else. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. So it, it was quite a shock, but in a way it was gratifying to us to realize that we'd not missed a trick somewhere and uh, what we were stopped what we were finding to be true was true for all uh, so-called illnesses whether it was in humans or animals yeah it seems like uh, from my research too most animal disease comes from man mucking it up and yeah. uh, all the way back to cowpox right um, where when this takes us back to Jenner and, and the whole smallpox issue but it was man's uh, improper sanitation with milking the cows yeah, yeah. and and it, and so it, it seems like if you look into actual nature and if we just left nature be nature it would flourish and now you might have a occasional volcanic eruption or something that would cause some toxicity and disease but for the most part it's man mucking about that's causing these issues from what yeah. I can gather. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because that, <laughs> that brought me on to it, reminded me of another interesting story that we looked into and that was the black death. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. So it's plague, uh, which we were all taught in school. or well, We certainly we were that it was all to do with infected rat fleas. Um, again, kind of long story short, but we did look into that and uh, relied quite a bit on, the work uh, by a dendrochronologist, uh, Professor Mike Bailey at a university in uh, Ireland. And um, he did a, a lot of work to in, into looking. He wrote a book called New Light on the Black Death, which is, if you can get it, which you probably can't anymore, but uh, quite interesting. But again, what we found, we thought, okay, you know, this is another part of the investigation. We're told that, uh, you know, tens of thousands of people well, probably more millions uh, died worldwide because of this Black Death, this plague. 
Um, so let's have a look at that. Let's see what the cause of that was. And um, <clears throat> was it really infected rat fleas? Uh, well, of course, I think people are starting to realize now that that's a complete fallacy and there's no uh, scientific evidence to substantiate that. But so we thought, well, OK, then, well, well what is it? Um, and so we looked into eyewitness accounts at the time and uh, Mike Bailey uh, looked into tree rings. And that was his speciality, dendrochronology. So by looking at tree rings, he could tell what the atmosphere was like. <clears throat> In various periods of history. And he also examined ice cores as well, so the two correlated with one another. And again, long story short, what he found was that the at that time of the Black Death, the Earth's uh, atmosphere, the air, was extremely badly polluted. I mean, it was really toxic, poisonous, very high levels of ammonia and other things. Um, and this would account for why people were literally dropping dead in the street. Um, you know, there was no sort of incubation period of uh, someone starting to be ill over a couple of weeks, they get worse and die. People were well one moment and dead the next. Um, and other interesting facts from eyewitness account is that uh, fish in the rivers and lakes were floating to the surface dead. Well, obviously, that certainly discounts rat fleas um, biting the fish. So, you know, there's something else at play now. If the atmosphere was so polluted and poisoned and people were dying like that all over Europe um, and the rivers were poisoned, then that again would uh, show that what Mike Bailey had found in his tree rings, that the atmosphere, this atmosphere was extremely toxic. There was also eyewitness accounts of uh, a comet uh, passing by and certain volcanic eruptions, all again, which would would or could and earthquakes yeah all of which could uh, add more toxicity to the atmosphere and all these things accumulating at that particular time would account for why the atmosphere became so poisonous um and it was so also it was also the uh, grand solar minimum cycle at that time which we've covered so that you had um that leads to further volcanic eruptions uh colder atmosphere or excuse me colder conditions on the planet so that all syncs up, which, by the way, is happening right now. So. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yes, yes. But it's all to do with um, actual, the, the natural environment of, of the world. So yes. it's not about, you know, these little minute creatures running around. Um, well, the rats running around and shedding their fleas because um, that are uh, infected with bacteria. So it's, it's uh, so it, far more plausible. Well, it, a lot more plausible. So the, the true science and history really gives a lie to this thing that we were all taught uh, in schools about uh, infected rat fleas, uh, you know, giving people the Black Death. So again, it showed that uh, even in ancient times, you know, if people had just looked at the history and paid attention to the eyewitness accounts, people who were alive at the time and the written records are there, uh, and people like Mike Bailey who've done the science as well, they could see that, uh, again, nothing to do with germs, lots of plausible answers as to what that plague was about. And, and so it goes on. And we, we examined the 1918 supposed flu epidemic, uh, found again it was nothing to do with virus and, and so on. And uh, uh, Mike, you mentioned about uh, solar activity. And uh, again, that sort of brings us uh, around to sort of the electrical systems of the earth um, and the effects on human beings, not only from the electri electrical effects of the sun during certain sunspot activity and, and solar activity, which affects the um, Earth's electrical system, if you like, which we all depend on, um, but also the false electrical interference, which is increasing, which we talked about earlier, from electricity and te telecommunications, radar, and all of these sorts of things. So, um, Yes, there are some natural interferences with uh, the Earth's electrical atmosphere. And again, the guy who wrote the book, uh, The Invisible Rainbow, sort of looks at several plague instances going back in ancient history and correlates them with solar activity. Um, so in, long before uh, telecommunication yeah. systems came on the scene. But now, of course, uh, we're interfering with the Earth's electrical system and our own body electrical systems with artificial radiation from 
telecommunications and ra excuse me and radar and electricity generally um, because all electrical things give out uh, electrical radiation and uh, the body because it's got a very complex and very subtle electrical system it's very easy to affect it i mean we've all experienced um, you know if you've got a, a little portable radio and you bring some power tool near it um, <clears throat> and turn the dial a little bit on your radio you'll hear lots of crackling and screaming uh, coming from your radio and that's the electrical interference from the power tool well the body's in a way is exactly the same you know you bombard it with uh, high power uh, electrical interference and the little subtle voltages in the body can soon be disrupted you know and when you're talking about the heart the brain uh, the neurological system um, these are it's easily provable that these are being very adversely affected by the electrical systems that now surround us yeah arthur furstenberg is the and author there just so we, the give, we, we give him a shout out and real quick bear um he did was on a recent 5g uh, panel and he did say we have three months left thanks to spacex which was a little alarming to me but and we come from a and this is a whole other topic, but um, so anyways, uh, everyone check out uh, that book. We, it's on our, in fact, if you want to get uh, Don and David's book and Arthur's book, you go to alphavedic.com forward slash book list. And we have our link there to all the books that we recommend. And that would help us out because we get a little referral there. So uh, Bear, what were you going to say? I was just going to comment that not just are our bodies electrical, but we swim in an electrical medium. And, you know, uh, scientists like to talk about um, black holes and voids of space and all these sorts of things. There's no such thing. Uh, it's one continuous electrical medium. And when you look at the fact that we are a composite of electrical vectors that are actual waveforms, and, uh, you know, they say, well, you know, there's all this space. Well, no, not at all. Um, and, 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 you know, it's like arguing, saying the, um, you know, the waves in the ocean don't need water. You know, it's just, mm. we're an interconnected network. So these electrical vectors uh, can not, not be affected by all of these electronics that date back, you know, way predating 5G all the way to the advent of just the, the first electrical grid in its most crude form. The other thing that we really need to take into account, and it's a bit much for this conversation, is that there's a whole understanding of how our psyche, which is another way of saying our pure consciousness, when we in this simulation, if you will, are um, perceiving a traumatic event to our psyche, uh, something that animals on an instinctual level where they would interpret a uh, threat to their survival. We have our own social um, kind of translations of those survival mechanisms. And what's really different about uh, the human organism and the human consciousness, which is a different resonant field. And that's been measured and, and documented. You know, we are different than the animal life. And so built into our consciousness is a connection to allow biology to mirror those assaults on the psyche, which is all electrical events. And then the brain is the medium, uh, not physical in and of itself, but what we think of as uh, uh, the medium between the psyche, the consciousness and the body that will then trigger these events happening in the body. And the more you understand uh, how this actually works, then it explains a great deal uh, of all the confusion that surrounds contagions and disease and so forth. And um, New German medicine is the, the best example. And having been a practitioner of that for many years, I can say that uh, many times you don't even have to employ bioterrain medicine if you uh, are artful in helping people make those links between their biological condition what we think of as disease and what triggered it in the psyche and uh, it's also been borne out in other uh, um, disciplines Chinese medicine um, homeopathy where they have their own languaging discussing the same phenomena so I just wanted to put that out because 
uh, you know, it's, yeah, we're electrical, we live in an electrical medium, and there's a lot more in-depth explanations that have been bored, borne out by real evidence that, um, you know, disease has many, many uh, causes and isn't disease in the first place, as you already mentioned. So, please. Yeah, we, I mean, I, I know we touched on it a little earlier in the conversation about the, about mind and the power of mind over you know, uh, not only our bodies, but actually our physical experiences. Um, uh, but if we look at it on what we say, the, the small end of it, the placebo effect, which is well known to medical practitioners and is, is used by medical practitioners, uh, where they use so-called sugar pills to, unbeknown to the patients, to fool them into thinking certain things will happen if they take this particular pill. And they get very good results from it. So that's a little example of how powerful mind is over the body. But I, I know because you've uh, talked about uh, uh, mind in a much greater uh, field um, of us being conscious beings. And so if we sort of delve into that a little bit, because I think it's pertinent to the situation that the world finds itself in now. And uh, I did speak to someone the other day where I sort of borrowed some of the words of... Uh, famous English writer, Charles Dickens, um, from one of his stories, A Tale of Two Cities. And he opens the story with, this is the best of times, this is the worst of times. And I think that's very apt for now. And I, if I sort of explain that a little bit, what I'm getting at is, you know, the worst of times is now because of what's happened to the world, because of the catastroph catastrophic and draconian measures that the world government that sits behind the scenes has taken and the dire effects that it's had on humanity um, with uh, misery, with people losing their jobs, businesses going out of business, people dying on their own, not being able to see their friends and family at the times when they're most vulnerable, all of this sort of thing, terrible, terrible things that are happening all around the world based on a lie. So the worst of times. But it's also the best of times because, and I know you said this once, uh, Bear, you know, you, you used the analogy of the Klingon spaceship, didn't you? Where um, to fire its weapons, it has to lower its uh, uh, cloaking device. And it, and it is, that's a good analogy, I like that. Because, you know, these uh, despicable people have, to do what they've done, they've, they've lowered their cloaking device. We can see them for what they are now. We can see them that they're despicable and they are ruthless and will stop at nothing, whether it's no matter how big the lie is and how much damage they cause, we can see them. And because we can see them, it's the best of times where people for the first time who've not been aware of what's been going on can now start to get together and see these people for what they are and think, right, this is it. We have to get together. And I'm not talking about violence here. I'm talking about mentally to get together and expect better, you know, to put their conscious creation, if you like, to a better thing. And again, I'm not saying to people, yeah, you can just sit at home and uh, hope for good things. No, it needs to be a bit more positive than that. But the power of mind to create the reality that we want, now that we know who the enemy is, if you like, um, it should help people to concentrate more and to be more not to be despondent, we as a collective, if you like, the people of the world are, there are big enough in number and are powerful enough in mind to be able to change the reality we're experiencing now for a reality that we all would like of true freedom and harmony. And we can do this by putting our minds to it. Yes, there are little actions we can take, whether it's, well, I'm not going to wear that mask, I'm not going to do social distancing, whatever it is, little things but to really expect that we can have a good outcome. So that's why I say it's also the best of times. We have an ideal opportunity now for large numbers of the world population to see these people for what they are who have inflicted this on the world and refuse to have anything to do with them. But they have to stop living in fear. So they have to break through that fear um, because that is so... Uh, that's so powerful and that's holding them in a place that is not helpful, not creative, not productive. And it, it's, um, it, it's not taking advantage of the opportunity, if you like. And um, it's not that we have to change their minds, but 
Well, we do we have anyway. to, well, we, well, we have to put the information out um, so that we can help people see it for themselves and change their own minds. We, we can't change we can't change people, but we can help them change themselves. And we've got to show them that um, they're being told lies, um, basically, and uh, to show them that, it, yeah, that there's no reason to live in fear, that we can actually change this and we can actually make things better. A lot mm. of people, you know, it's, it's not just, uh, oh, well, you know, sit there and hope, hope for the best, as David said, you know, there Could are things that we can it. do, yeah. like communicating with each other, but also refusing to buy into the fear, to, to refuse to um, submit to these actions and these, uh, and a lot of people are doing that and resisting. And, I'm, you know, we are seeing a lot of people saying, no, I'm not going to wear the mask. Um, and being prepared to stand their ground and stand on their principles. And, and that's just so, so um, brilliant that, you know, people are, people are doing this and we're seeing this and it's, it's encouraging. It's, you know, it's, yeah. it's supporting our hope and our expectations of, of things being able to um, work their way through. Um, and that's why it is such, you know, it is the best of times because it, it's such an opportunity. And, yeah, and we yeah. just we don't want people to miss it. We don't want people to miss this opportunity. I mean, people, we get a lot of feedback since our book went out, which is only at the beginning of this year, really. So it's not long. Um, and we've been very encouraged by the feedback that we're getting through emails. I mean, yes, you'll always get the naysayers. Uh, it doesn't matter what you do, but just ignore them. But the vast majority of people have been very supportive. Uh, tell us that it's woken them up. And uh, this is very encouraging. So we know that this can happen. This wave can happen. This wave of a changing consciousness can happen. And it's very, very important that uh, and that's why we do what we do. And I'm sure you guys do what you do to bring this education, if you like, to people. Um, and we just hope that we can get people to think. I know some people have said sort of rather uncharitably that, uh, you know, you can lead a person to knowledge, but you can't make them think. And that's, <laughs> I suppose there's some truth in that. But we mustn't stop trying and um, because it's such a golden opportunity. So hence yeah. the best of times. Sorry if I yeah, went as an there, but... <laughs> No, no, that's, that's, uh, that was brilliant. Um, as an educator too, you have to um, practice a bit of discernment because uh, some people are unreachable and it's really nobody else's business what that person chooses to experience. So uh, with a little bit of practice, you can read between the lines and see if you're wasting your own energy, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, in the process. Because there are, as you point out, many people that are really hungering for the truth and really want change in their lives. So it's a matter, uh, you know, within our circles, we, we talk about this all the time. It's, it's like in emergency medicine, we do triage, you know, where you... You say, okay, uh, you have multiple bodies and you just have to make some choices. You say, well, I, I can, you know, save this one, this one, and that one, uh, sorry, you know, and you just move your efforts to the, to the ones that, you know, are actually salvageable. And uh, it's the same thing with education. And also, you know, um, as a practitioner, um, you, you learn that you can be practicing the most enlightened form of medicine and really understand how a person got themselves into a biological predicament in the first place. But as you said, you, you can't, you can bring them the water, but you can't force them to drink. Mm -hmm. So all you can do is just say, well, here, and you know, I, you see people all the time make decisions that are really contrary to their, to their welfare. And mm -hmm. I think it's the same thing with information. And it really takes a, a minority of humanity uh, when we understand that the truth, as we're you know, just loosely putting it, has a lot of uh, energy behind it uh, because it's in alignment with universal principles. Mm -hmm. And you can take all the globalists and the central bankers and you know, all these people, and they're really insignificant. And all of the buttons that they have their fingers on and the control that they think they have relative to the real powers that be, they're nothing. So when we step into the truth and just a, a small portion of humanity steps into the truth, we're riding a wave that's already there. 
And yeah. it's not going to take many of us to jump onto that wave before the whole thing shifts, that whole critical mass concept, which, by the way, critical mass can be very conveniently um, explained with waveform physics. And it's not just a terminology. I mean, it really works that way. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, wonderful. Uh, any thoughts? Well, 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 yes, I mean, uh, it was all starting to get a bit philosophical, but quite important, I think, that we brought that in. I mean, I know because of your uh, interest in, uh, um, it is Walter, you know, Russell, Walter Russell, Russell, Walter Russell, Walter Russell. Russell. let's get the name mixed up. Uh, because of your recommendation, someone we want to read about as well. We've, in the past, as I say, it was about 15 years ago when we wrote a little book about the nature of reality and we looked at what the real nature of reality is and our, our little book was very popular at the time um, but uh, we relied on quite a lot of work of uh, all the old philosophers and some new ones and uh, also a guy called uh, Dr Amit Goswami who uh, wrote a book about the, un the conscious universe, self universe. the self-aware universe um, and that was particularly interesting because uh, coming from an uh, Indian Asian background, but also as a medical practitioner, he was able to bring together in his book uh, sort of ancient uh, Hindu teachings with sort of more modern day physics. Um, he was actually a physicist. And it's a very interesting combination and we found it very useful. And he wrote in very good terms. I, I don't know whether he's still around, but uh, hopefully his book's still around. And uh, I think it brings into modern terms just um, how you can understand the conscious nature of reality and just how powerful it is. Um, so well, well worth a look at, uh, or even look at our little book. <laughs> well, um, science ceased to be science when we took philosophy away. Without philosophy, there's no guiding uh, intelligence. There's no purpose. It's just uh, an empty endeavor. Uh, you know, in the martial arts, we call it empty forms. There's no mana behind it. There's no feeling. There's, and that's what we find ourselves now in what we call scientism because they try to take, you know, remove it from philosophy. And Walter Russell has uh, most eloquently um, you know, explains how uh, real science is a combination of observation and philosophy in equal measure. Yeah, I mean, philosophy going back to the sort of ancient Greeks uh, was always all encompassing. It was basically, as they saw it, the search for truth in whatever form it took. And you're quite right that that's been sort of split up into all sorts of little packages now. And uh, so what we have is a divorce of uh, true understanding with sort of what they call today science. And unfortunately, um, you know, the investigations that we have done in the research for this book um, showed that science has become prostituted, really, uh, for want of a better word, um, because of the way things are funded. And I'm sure you know this. Uh, uh, so people... You know, whoever pays the piper calls the tune, as it were. And so uh, science is now just uh, to be had by the highest bidder. And uh, if people start to go uh, off target, as it were, with what, let's say, it's a pharmaceutical company that's paying for the research. Uh, but if findings are not really what the pharmaceutical company want, then they'll either have uh, their funding removed or they get fired. So, you know, that's not science and that's not a healthy environment for anything truly scientific to grow in. But unfortunately, that's the situation we've got now. So that's why we're getting all these uh, so-called scientists standing up and just saying anything that they're told to say uh, with no actual real scientific basis behind it, which brings us full circle again, of course, back to the coronavirus where you'll get, and we're bombarded with them, people who are supposed to know better you know, telling us stuff that we know is complete rubbish and is not based on any science whatsoever. But, you know, they're on a, obviously on a decent salary and they want to keep their job. Uh, and I just say shame on them. You know, we, we have a situation now that um, a small group, relatively small group of people uh, perpetuating this lie up to the public, uh, which is really aided and abetted by the mainstream media. 
I mean, if you think about it, if you took the mainstream media out of this picture of what's going on, they would not have been able to carry out what they've done. But the mainstream media obviously bought and paid for, and shame on them too, um, because for the most part, the people in the media are just talking heads. You know, they call themselves journalists, but they're not. You know, they've uh, they've never done any proper research into anything they say. Otherwise, they wouldn't be saying it. So again, they're on a nice salary. They say the words, whatever's on the script, and tell the lies without even realizing that they're lying. But there are certain ones in there that do know they're telling lies. So double shame on them. So we've, we've, this is the situation we're in. We've got a lie that's been perpetrated by, whether you want to call them globalists, whoever they are, these people that are behind the governments. You know, The governments of the world didn't think this up on their own. You know, They were told what to do. They all had to act in concert as they did and backed up by false science from uh, their bought and paid for scientists and bought and paid for medical establishment and bought and paid for mainstream media and this gang if you like I, i'm trying to choose my words carefully because I, I i have no i have no words of comfort to say about these people i think they're disgraceful because they've caused so much harm but my hope is uh, being ever the optimist with what we said earlier that people will see them for what they are and will never trust them again and therefore the corrupt government systems that we have, the corrupt media systems and the corrupt pharmaceutical and medical systems that we have, people will reject them, um, not in a violent way, they just won't take any notice of them in future. And they'll turn to or people like yourself and, and, and us that are saying, well, have a look at this and I think you'll find it makes much more sense. And there's lots of people doing this and rather than being regarded as the alternatives, will become the mainstream and people will have a lot better lives for it and i sincerely hope that that will come to pass in what could be as i said earlier the best of times because the, the body really needs to go back to being recognized as uh, holistic you know that it's it's an interconnected organism and um all these efforts by uh, the, the medical establishment over the decades of trying to create uh, specialisms for each separate part of the body and regard them as being um, not connected to other parts so you know you get obviously all these well I don't need to tell you all these different specialists they only look at one part and they don't realize that that what affects that part may not be um, or, or any kind of damaged tissue that they see in that part may not be caused by something that's attacked that part. It could be something to do with somewhere else. And it could even, as you know, going back to what you were saying, could even be something to do with, um, you know, the, the psyche, the, the ideas, the beliefs. And, and you know, that, that can be shown by people. Uh, I think it's called dying from the diagnosis or something like that, where certain people who are given a diagnosis of, uh, of cancer and get a prognosis or well you know three months or something like that and you know been recorded that they you know they obey their uh, physician and pretty much die um, just about on the three months there are other people who say no I don't accept that I reject that and um, go on to live very healthy lives because they don't draw themselves you know like we we're saying before they don't own the disease they don't um, believe in the label they just say okay well um and as you were saying before that they recognize that sometimes this is an opportunity this that there's something meaningful in in something that's going on and they need to do something or it i mean i'm not trying to say there's you know it's the same thing for everybody it'll be different for everybody of course because we're all individuals um even though we are all interconnected um so there'll be different opportunities for each person and it's a question of trying to see what that particular um, problem is giving them an opportunity to see, even if it is to say, right, I need to look at my diet. I need to look at my lifestyle. I need to make some changes in my life and do something so I can, you know, if your health is important to you, you say, right, I, I now need to do something because I, I can make some changes. <clears throat> and there are plenty of cases of, of people who've, you know, uh, I'm, well, I'm sure I, I don't need to tell you people who've had the diagnosis, made the changes and are absolutely fine and, and live a, a perfectly healthy life, you know, years, decades, whatever, you know, that it's, it's, they just don't have anything to do with that 
label anymore. And we, we've come across numerous cases of this, um, and particularly with what people consider the more serious disease, cancer, you know, that, that mm. most people are terribly afraid of and is becoming more prevalent, you know, and now estimate that one in two people will have cancer. Um, <clears throat> but we won't go into it too much, but what I was going to say is uh, I have in my family personal experiences of um, a person with cancer, a diagnosed with cancer, and uh, uh, as well as taking the treatment, uh, which did kill them in the end, but also died of the diagnosis as to when they were going to die. Uh, it was a, one of my first battles with the medical establishment that started to open my eyes when I saw there was something drastically wrong because it was very personal and I could see what was happening. Um, but we've come across other cases where, again, and we were looking at this only the other day, a relatively young man had been diagnosed with multiple cancers in his body, but had absolutely refused the uh, conventional treatments, i.e. chemo and radiotherapy. He thought there must be something, must be a different way. It was purely intuitive. And um, uh, he actually fought against his... Uh, oncologists and uh, cancer nurse and all the rest of it, even though and this is a disgraceful thing, his cancer nurse said to him, well, you, you have you have the choice of you either have the chemotherapy or death, which is <laughs> a disgraceful thing to say to someone, but that's what he was told. Well, he, he said, well, I'm, I'm not going for the chemo. And uh, in actual fact, he went uh, for the Gerson therapy. Gerson. Yeah, which is basically quite a, as I'm sure you know, quite a, um an intense detox system we'll, we'll say but uh, his cancers were all cleared up you know i mean he's what i think it was he's about 42 but you know originally a couple of years ago they'd sort of given him about six months to live and uh, now several years down the line he's living a healthy life fitter than he's ever been and cancer free and this was nothing to do with chemotherapy or any of the other mainstream it was really as i say the gearson thing is a a pretty intense detoxification system. Um, you know, I'm not saying that's what everyone has to do, but it's, you know, in various ways, we know very, as you do, you, we know very much about the importance of detoxification and uh, certain things you need to do depending on how toxic your body is at the time. And this is different for everyone, as Dawn said. But if you live the healthy life, with the right diet and all the, the four factors that we mentioned in the book, you will never get to the stage where you have a dire situation of uh, cancer about to take your life or, or any other disease for that matter. You live a long and healthy life without it costing you lots of money um, and uh, without having to pay any, any uh, high fees to the medical establishment. And we have so much knowledge available and so many tools to use. And, you know, for me, my frustration is just, uh, you know, having people not just be aware of them, but just understand, you know, the efficacy of these things. For instance, Gerson is, a, is an amazing tool. Now, if you know a little bit more, you can understand in the case of cancer, for instance, it's a biphasic process. And so in one phase, which you can determine very easily by symptomatology and other things going on that a good clinician can discern, uh, you know what phase you're in. So Gerson will be very good in one phase. Now, if on the other hand, I determine that a client is in phase two, I know that they're already in the healing phase and they might still have a big growth somewhere in the body, but also I know that there are certain microorganisms that were part of that process from day one. And their job is when you're in phase two healing is to digest the tumor. And to do that, they need a little bit more protein. And so it might not be the time to go on a juice fast. Now I'm not suggesting um, animal protein versus plant protein. I happen to be a vegetarian too, but you know, I, I, I think it all works as long as you find what works for you. But, I could go on and on about all the methodologies that are available and that you could take something like Gersten, uh, bioterrain medicine, electromagnetic interventions, um, you know, oxidative therapies. And if you understand what biology, what nature is actually doing, you know exactly what point 
along that phase you're in, you know exactly what to employ at one time or at any particular time, and then your success rate just goes up dramatically. Uh, Gerson, compared to the average conventional system, is, is, it's off the charts. You know, it's just, it's just way more people get better. But now if you look at just Gerson in and of itself, you see that it, it still can be kind of a 50-50 thing, although that's way better odds, odds than conventional. But now if you know how to use Gerson at the right time along with other things, now all of a sudden your percentage is up in the you know, 90 percentiles. Mm -hmm. So all of that knowledge is available now. It's been right under our noses forever. It's been suppressed. Uh, people like myself are, you know, uh, <laughs> marginalized, persecuted, demonetized, gaslighted, uh, you name it. And, um, but people like yourself are getting the information out. The truth is out. You can't, the, the cat's out of the bag. So in one sense, we're home free. And I think at this point, the game we're playing is just trying to mitigate the carnage of what's already in motion because a lot of us are going to come out the other end and some people of their own volition are, you know, going to find out the consequences have, or actions have consequences. Yeah. I was going to say the, um, what you're saying about cancer, it, it shows that it's a process. It's not just a, a one-time something. And it's a process that takes years to develop quite often. So of course it, it you know, it's not going to be cured overnight. But what the medical establishment does is take a snapshot at one particular moment and think that that is um, something meaningful and relevant where it's only one part of a particular process or, one fa or not even one phase. It's, it's just well, a, a snapshot of something. But what you were saying about the microorganisms coming in to clean up the tumour. So, of course, with the medical establishment or researchers, scientific researchers, if they see lots of microorganisms on a tumour, they'll say, oh, well, the bacteria caused the tumour. You know, it's, it's a cause. They're always looking for a cause instead of realising it's a process and the, the bacteria are there for a reason um, and it, it's, it's a natural process. Uh, I mean, obviously things have to be done or certain things may have to be done, but again, it'll depend on the individual, as you were saying. And I mean, I'm sorry, it sounds like I'm preaching. To the, sorry, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I know you know this, but it's, it's, under, it's getting people to understand it's a, it's a process that takes time to build up and so therefore it's a process to to eradicate. Um, to eradicate but at the same time the body can do it for itself yeah. um, it can self-heal but it needs the support it needs the help you guys make an interesting you postulate the idea in the book that you know we really don't need quote-unquote medicine to be healthy and that's a it's a fallacy that's been pushed upon us since really back in the greek times as the chem, as being you know this chemical uh, makeup of our body, and it's actually much more um, much more complex than that, but also much more simple than that. Um, we don't really need medicine; we just need to you know maintain homeostasis in our natural, healthy terrain, and we'll be fine. Um, I do have one question from the peanut gallery here, and then actually there's a question earlier I'd love to get to in terms of smallpox. But um, what are some of your favorite simple detoxification remedies? to get back to that homeostasis so we're not having these um you know th these explosions of illness inside of us okay well uh, from our point of view it's uh diet uh, i mean <clears throat> diet is very important because it's the uh, getting the right nutrients into your body is what gives it uh the ability to have enough antioxidants it's where to start with this really that the body has a process uh, which is quite natural where on a daily basis with your the work and the things you do it produces uh, free radicals which under normal circumstances the body can deal with and get flushed out of the system uh, providing it has the correct, correct nutrition and correct amount of antioxidants which it gets from the fruit and vegetables the food you eat okay um, but if uh, you're not getting the correct nutrition, then the free radicals can build up. Uh, I mean, they are destructive and you can get cellular damage. I mean, I, I know I'm oversimplifying here, but I'm just trying to get the process over really. So under normal circumstances, 
yes, free radicals are produced, but also your nutrition produces enough antioxidants to keep the system clean and it's fine. Now, if there's certain things then that uh, disrupt that natural homeostasis, i.e. not getting the correct nutrients, uh, being subject to high levels of toxicity, um, electromagnetic radiation and high stress levels, all of those things will produce excesses of free radicals, which then can overwhelm the body and overwhelm the natural processes. And then you can get uh, tissue damage, organ damage. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing that we would say is the correct levels of nutrition is extremely important. But it's a little more complex than that because to get the correct levels of nutrition, you've got to eat the right food. And uh, I know uh, people think, well, you know, I go down to the local supermarket and I buy lots of fruit and veg, uh, so I should be okay. Yes, you would like to hope so. But unfortunately, um, because of factory farming that we have now, uh, a lot of the soils are re are dead they're unhealthy the soils don't have the full range of minerals and uh they're not healthy soils Bingo. so the plants the, the plants can't uptake the nutrients um you know they they need to be able to uptake the nutrients so that they can then pass them on to you when you eat them so if the nutrients aren't in the soil then they can't so that may look okay because of the chemical fertilizers that the farmers have used so they may look okay but they're not really as they're not really good food for you. So you may think you're eating healthily, uh, but you're not. So you can start to already be depleting the nutrients that your body needs. So yeah, diet is very important. Uh, <clears throat> of course, being vegetarians, we're very careful about our fruit and vegetable nuts as well, of course, very important. Um, we also recommend if you can to go organic as much as you can for the very reason. Uh, Organic foods uh, control the soils better of what they're grown in, so you're more likely to get nutritious food. Or they grow your own, of course. Or grow your <laughs> own organic and, and, and less get... likely to have glyphosate. <laughs> well, yes, yes, that's why I say grow your own, because I, I know you do. So, yes, it's, it's important to make sure that the food, well, water as well, yeah. is as clean as possible. Avoid the toxins as far as possible. Um, so it's, But it's not a question of... Uh, having a, a, an actual um, protocol for detoxing because your body's doing that all the time. The point is to try and clean up what you are putting into and onto the body to try and minimize, reduce or, or eliminate, you know, the toxic, toxic exposures. And then your let your body do the rest because some people do detoxes that are that, that pull toxins out but unless you're really careful um, you can end up with uh, problems and um, I, I can see you're, you're nodding so yes I mean this is it it's the detox de detoxification is a natural process and it's best to try not to speed it up but to help the body do yep. it for itself naturally. We try and ap approach things naturally as much as possible. We, yeah, I mean, that's the biggest issue we're facing right now is we are being forced out of the natural world. And that's the agenda at play. It's the transhumanistic model. It's everything. It's this, the ego of man, or not necessarily us as man, but the controllers, whatever you want to call them. They really, it's their ego where they think they can take over and control nature. And it's having adverse effects on everyone. And that's really what we're up against. And it's like, how do we go back to that, <clears throat> get back to nature? Because if, I feel like if, you know, we are in the Garden of Eden playing around like pure consciousness, we are infinite here on this planet. We live forever. We're completely happy. And then, you know, the snake comes and tempts us. And, you know, that, that analogy works so well. And the other thing too, the toxicity of our emotions, which Dr. Lando brought up earlier, related to um, you know our electrical systems and how those initiate disease is so important. So turn off the damn TV. Uh, if you're still paying for cable television and watching mainstream news, what the heck are you doing? Turn that garbage off. Stop um, buying into um, you know the AI derived news feeds, which really are. We were showing earlier this week that if you type in three digits and um, uh, you know results on Google, it'll bring up automatically coronavirus numbers that match that. 
Um, it's because AI systems have now been developed for the last 10 years that automatically write the news articles and infiltrate all systems of social media. We have to get off those systems and get decentralized and get back to nature. Otherwise, <clears throat> our emotions are being hijacked at all times, which is causing disease and toxicity all around us. And, um, you know, we recently shared on Telegram uh, Dr. Uh, Jerry Tennant and the stuff he's done showing the electrical system that Dr. Lando talks about. And he specifically says that, like all disease, most disease in terms of toxicity comes from our emotions. And so it's so important to get into, you know, and, and why I brought up the medicine idea is like, you're right, we don't need medicine. We need, you know, do qigong, qigong, do meditation, go run, get in the sun, go garden. These are the things we talk about all the time. They're free. Do breath work, fasting, stop eating. <laughs> you know, it's like these are all things that um, don't require much except for knowledge and some wherewithal and some, um, you know, dedication and, and determination and discipline to be healthy. These aren't, this isn't very complicated stuff. We overcomplicate no. everything, you know? Exactly. <laughs> and it's not but really us, it's the system doing it. But Yeah, you know. but there are things... There are things that people need to be aware of um, because the, uh, as we say, one of the four factors that uh, leads to people's ill health is uh, tox toxicity from the outside coming in, you know, toxins. Uh, <clears throat> and the number of places that these uh, toxic, toxic chemicals can come from is quite surprising. And we've often surprised people when we've talked about the toxicity of clothing, of which people don't often think about. And, uh, you know, the sort of manufactured clothes with the plasticizers and uh, GM cottons and things like that. Um, and the chemicals that are in the clothes, in the manufacture of them, I've often said, you know, just, well, you probably know it too, just trying to buy a pair of socks uh, without some biochemical in them to supposedly protect you from bacteria is really difficult. You know, can't even buy a pair of socks because they put something in it. And, uh, and this is the problem. And so, you know, you're buying toxic clothing uh, without being aware of it sometimes. So it's not only in the cosmetics and body washes that people may use, um, it, it's in the clothes as well as in the air that you breathe, uh, the food that you eat and the water. I mean, I'm sure you're very careful about your water. I mean, we, we have a reverse osmosis system on our water because you can't trust what's in the water supply. And there's some really yeah. nasty things in it. In the UK, right at source that the water treatment plants, as well as their filtration systems not being very good, so you get all sorts of pharmaceutical products and all sorts of things in your water supply through the tap, but they actually add things like uh, chlorine, fluoride, and now ammonia, would you believe, in the UK? You think, whose idea was this? You know, and this is all to kill germs so that your water is healthy for you. Well, Psycho. That's a load, complete load of rubbish. So, you know, you really need to protect yourself so something like uh, a distiller um, or a reverse osmosis system is really, uh, it's really compulsory, you know, because you really need a clean water supply. So it's simple things. So a little outlay of money, but you have to do it. So, you know, you have to watch what you're wearing. You need to put what, basically we say, you have to be very careful about what you put on and in your body and think about it because that's how the, the toxicity levels of your body goes up. The body's a great thing, as we've all said, you know, and it can do a lot to protect itself, but it can be overwhelmed. And in the day and age that we live in now, we're bombarded with so much, so many toxins from all sorts of sources. And this is without the toxic medicines that uh, the uh, pharmaceutical companies would have us have, which includes vaccines, of course, which are highly toxic and have never been proved to confer immunity, but they have been proved to confer a lot of harm, but that's a big subject all on its own. So there's a, a complete assault on people um, all the time. So people do need to think about these things uh, to make sure that they can keep a healthy body and give the body a chance to uh, heal itself and not be overwhelmed by this toxic attack that it's under most of the time. And, and this can be done. You know, I know I'm, I'm not being a, a doomsday merchant. I think, you know, oh, you know, it's terrible. We're all going to die. Uh, far from it. I mean, uh, Dawn and I have been vegetarian for many decades. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we are quite old. But, um, <laughs> you 
you know, we, we don't go to the doctors, we don't take any pharmaceutical products and uh, we're fit and healthy and expect to remain so for many more years. So uh, it can be done and it doesn't cost lots of money. It's very easy, but the rules are quite strict. That's all we say. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I think the proof of the pudding in that, uh, you know, going back to our conscious, uh, our consciousness, uh, that is really the determining factor of everything is, you know, we're talking to you folks and, and uh, all these things that you're talking about are just intuitive. They're obvious. And uh, whereas a lot of people make different choices because it's not so obvious to them. And I just, uh, and, and again, it's not a, a judgment of any type, it's just people are at different levels along the journey. And I agree 100% uh, with everything you say about nutrition but we can bring nutrition even to another whole level of discussion. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned um, free radicals. So, okay, so now we're in the level of chemistry where we're in the, one of the, the main polarities in the, in the physical world here, which is uh, oxidation reduction. Well, that's just a hologram of another polarity imbalance that's happening upstream in our consciousness, which will then also uh, give a predilection to some people making dietary choices that maybe you and I wouldn't make, but that's what they're drawn to. But it's really, you know, my opinion is it's holographically kind of mirroring down all the way into, you know, what we do to our environment, including our own bodies, what food choices we make, our lifestyle uh, style changes, and what we choose to believe or not to believe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yes. Yes. yes we would agree with that. It's yeah, it, it is, and we we had to sort of determine quite some time ago as we were writing this book and decided to put it out there. I mean, we'll make no secret of it we're, because it's quite a challenging title, and uh, we intended it to be so. And we thought, well, you know, well, we're going to do it because that's what we want to say. And we thought we were going to get a lot of stick, you know, and everyone would uh, dump on us, as it were. But just the opposite has happened. You know, as I say, there's a few naysayers out there who are just rude about anything. Uh, but you just ignore them. But we, the over, overwhelming responses have been great. So we know we're getting to people. And uh, yet speaking that truth is very important. Um, and getting the right mental attitude um, is very important and you know understanding the nature of reality in the way Dawn and I do we know that there are no such thing as coincidences you know everything happens for a reason and uh, the <clears throat> the world that we live in which appears to be external and physical but is not really as I'm sure you know um, we do explain that in another book but we, <laughs> we won't go into it now but what you think can change that reality and things that happen in the reality that we experience, you know, if you look at it as a feedback system and pay attention to it, of what you're seeing and what you're feeling and what you're being told, the experiences you're having, you can then make decisions on that basis. It's a feedback system for you personally um, all the time. And uh, most people are not aware of that. So they're unresponsive to it and they don't make the little subtle changes in their life in accordance with the feedback system yeah well, that's, the important, that's the important thing to take action it's yep. not just understanding how it works but to also take action it's the balance we call between intellect and intuition so it, it's Bingo. getting that balance with with what to do and what to understand and how to change how your thoughts are it's it's uh yeah it's and, an to, interesting and, to journey. and to understand how ego that part of our sort of mental makeup can mislead you you know and if you're not careful it can override that little voice of intuition which is yes. working from a different level of consciousness and if people develop the skills to listen to that small voice as it's often called and ignore ego they will more often get on the right path you know intuition once you trained yourself to understand when it is true intuition and not just wishful thinking, <laughs> you know, where you think, no, intuition is telling me I really do need a Mercedes car. Um, you know, you're going you're gonna to lead yourself astray. But once you've sort of trained yourself to do that, um, you'll get uh, um, a much better progress in life. Yeah. It is much more beneficial to you.
Well, you guys will love Walter Russell because he really stresses that point of going into your inner fulcrum uh, and uh, where the ego is just really uh, in the way your mind works. It's all just memories and external thoughts. That's not really who you are. Uh, and that can be really deceptive. Um, yeah. And, you know, mentioning the manif basically manifesting our reality, right, is what you're talking about, Don, in terms of, um, you know, uh, being more active in our life. And I was just watching a, a bio movie. I love watching bio, bio, you know, like movies about famous people who are very successful. And you'll notice that in most of these uh, books and movies about very successful people in the world is that they're like on this roller coaster ride where it seems like all these random events happen to them that push them to the next level. And you really what it is, is they're manifesting that through their own intuition. And it's really fun to see that. And it happens in all of our lives. It's just a matter of some people are able to, to better uh, kind of manifest that with their own abilities. And I think, unfortunately, right now, we're seeing a lot with the, the Generation Z and the millennials is that they've been conditioned to be very responsive instead of being proactive. So they're yeah. all very re reactive. And so we're seeing that with these um, quote unquote, you know, all well, these riots essentially, and everything that's going around the world is because they're reactive instead of taking responsibility and actually being proactive. And that's what really what we stress here with Alpha Vedic and why we're, I'm, like I always say, I'm an eternal optimist. And like you were saying, it really is the, the best of times as, you know, as well, because we more than ever, and, and there are people in the scientific circles that are showing this, that our consciousness can, it does create a reality. And so um, it's a really empowering notion that we got to keep stressing to people is to go into your heart, go into your intuition and learn how to do that, because then you won't be sick. Uh, you'll be empowered. You'll be able to create your, your hero's journey in a positive way, no matter what's going on around you. And uh, life is amazing. Life's supposed to be fun and an adventure. Um, and, you know, if we can embrace that, no matter what external is externalizing around us, we can have that amazing hero's journey. So I just wanted to stress that again, because, you know, diving into all this stuff can get dark and gloomy and, and a lot of doom, but really, um, on the flip side, it's all super amazing positivity coming out of this knowledge. Um, we are running up against time, and I did want to get to this one question because this is something I've wanted to cover uh, a lot because we talk about you know germ theory and transference and all this stuff and how people get sick. And one of the things that people always go back to is uh, the idea, and this really plays more into history than anything and how history has always changed. But uh, here's a question from... Uh, Gilfish earlier about an hour ago, but um, how would you explain the story of the smallpox epidemics that were spread among the Native American tribes through contaminated blankets? Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is a very interesting one and one we did look into really. Well, first let me say that um, if you look at the historical evidence about it, it's by no means definite that that actually ever happened you know and uh, that's the fact of it but we're not saying that smallpox didn't happen but what we're saying the the story about the blankets um there's no we could not find and we did look we could not find any provable historical evidence for that actually ever happening um as regards the conquest of the americas uh, South America first with the conquistadors. Yeah, we looked at that. There's some very good historical books. Dr. David Stannard, uh, American historian, wrote a very good book. Um, American they Holocaust. called the American Holocaust. Recommend it. Um, he does talk about smallpox and things, so he's not quite on the mark with some of it. But his history of what happened and what really happened to the South American people when the conquistadors moved in. Uh, because of they were quite barbaric, they had very superior weapons, and their sole reason for being there was to exploit the land and to exploit the people uh, because they wanted gold and silver, they wanted the minerals, and they enslaved the people, they drove them off their lands. Um, so once you drive people off their lands, we know because the people were healthy people, they had good lives, good civilization, they would feed themselves properly, you know, there was a good civilization. But once you drive people off that through fear and uh, murder, which is what was happening, massacres, then they, they were driven into uh, lands where they were not able to farm, uh, not, the, not the time. So they, it was our old enemy of lack of nutrition. 
Now, once people uh, don't have the correct nutrition, the body starts to break down internally and lesions appear, blisters appear, all sorts of things appear. A bit like scurvy, going back in history where it was seen to be with the British sailors, uh, lack of vitamin C, you know, um, it's that sort of thing. So this is what was happening. I'm trying to cut a very long story short here. Um, but this is what was happening to the uh, South American people. Um, the ones that did not get enslaved by the conquistadors to do the mining for them were literally starved to death um, in their millions. And over a period of about 50 years, I think it was, um, the invaders, both in South America and then the British, I have to say, in North America, uh, who carried out similar sort of exercises of exploiting the people, driving them off their lands. Um, the, the, in the Americas, uh, they wiped out almost all of the indigenous people off the islands and off the mainland who just died, really. Um, and was, we, it was even so horrific with the conquistadors, and this is explained by uh, Dr. Stanor. Um, it was so bad that they, when they enslaved the people, to go into the mines to mine the silver they didn't even bother to feed them it, on the basis that uh, well why bother because when they die we just chuck them out and we get some more there's plenty of people here to enslave sounds unbelievable doesn't it but there's witness accounts by um the church of all the plate people that were out there some of the friars that went out with the conquistadors so this is written down so it is historical fact but not many people know about it so it's a good piece of work that uh, Dr. Stanard did to show the horrors of what went off in South America. It was truly a Holocaust. So he's named the book well. And uh, it was not a case of uh, the people dying out, which is a popular myth that the conquistadors bought, bought across syphilis and uh, smallpox. Yeah, smallpox. And, um, and that's what killed the people. And so the yeah. sort of uh, authorities could just hold up their hands and say, well, you know, it wasn't really our fault. Uh, Blame you know, it on the you know. invisible germ. Yeah, you know, it was... Oh, absolutely. Oh, they, they just had no immunity and they died off. Well, that's a complete lie. They were, they were probably much healthier than the conquistadors because they lived absolutely. a more in yes, tune natural were. life. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I mean, that, they were. I mean, and, they were uh, yeah. <laughs> so, no, please, you continue. So that's, that's just a brief history of the South America and something very similar happened in, the, in North America, but it, it was the British eye. Haste to say, uh, nothing to do with me, but uh, <laughs> one before <laughs> my time. Yeah. Uh, but the similar sort of thing: exploitation for riches to for enrichment for the invaders, and to the decimation of the indigenous people. Um, so nothing to do with uh, people's lack of immunity to germs. Nothing to do with that at all. The other thing to to bring up again: David mentioned mining, but I mean um, mining. It wasn't just for silver, uh, gold as well. But gold is. Gold mining is associated with uh, exposing um, cinnabar mercury, so which is extremely toxic. So uh, th that would have killed people um, fairly quickly anyway. So there were a lot of, and in fact, actually mining is, um, you know, goes back millennia. And that's one of the um, uh, uh, activities, the operations that have brought a lot of the toxic material up into the atmosphere that, or into the environment that pe that expose people because that's one of the things we get asked oh well you know the you know industrial toxins weren't around um in the ancient past so how pe how did people get ill then there weren't any environmental toxins well there were around uh, mining uh, mining operations um every time the uh, ground is opened up and materials brought to the surface then it exposes um well, can yeah, expose toxic, material, to toxic yeah. materials, which could include yeah. uh, mercury, uranium, all, all sorts. Yeah, I mean, uranium is a, a main point because uh, particularly in the UK and in areas that where I used to live in Derbyshire, uh, lots of lead mines and people don't realise that lead is a, a decay product of uranium. You know, that's what it decays to. So wherever you've got lead deposits, you're going to have uranium, which as we know is radioactive, highly toxic. So and again, radon gas, and radon gas, gas leaches, which is uh, which is still a big problem in areas of Derbyshire, um, and causes cancers in people because you can't smell it, taste it, see it, um, but it's highly toxic and it leaks into people's houses because they don't realise that they're on um, old lead workings which have been disturbed, and as I say, mm. 
uh, lead is a, a decay product of uranium, which is still there. And then you get radon gas, which is leaching up into people's houses and poisoning them. But of course, the authorities keep all these things secret because uh, for all sorts of financial reasons. And try to blame a germ. And try to blame a germ. You know, yeah. Yeah. that person's Another, called cancer. <laughs> Another so, comment about the, uh, sorry, you need to finish that. No, go and carry No, on. that's okay. Oh, I, I was just going to say um, a final comment about the smallpox. Uh, when a, a people are dislocated, uh, you know, from their homeland when they're invaded uh, in new German medicine, we would uh, uh, call that a territorial conflict. And mm. we could actually, um, you know, give you proof, you know, evidence by CAT scans and, and other things that we do how that will affect a certain part of the brain that will then trigger a biological uh, response in certain tissues. So those tissues can relieve pressure in the psyche that's uh, suffering that territorial conflict, which will in fact give you the exact same manifestation of symptoms that we'd associate with things like smallpox. Mm -hmm. Also, the history of smallpox that I've read is that there was an officer that did um, suggest that, you know, maybe we'll try that technique of, uh, you know, uh, people that they thought had smallpox and, and, you know, share the blankets and maybe it'll infect uh, the indigenous. On the other hand, it was never really carried out. But then there was another uh, lower level officer that said, well, let's check it out. And they did it in a very small circumstance with a few people, nothing happened. So it was never tried again. So that was the beginning of the mythology that the blankets were the uh, the carriers of the contagion. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it, again, we we talk we talk about smallpox as a so-called disease in our book, and show that again, it's nothing to do with uh, viruses or bacterial germs of any sort. It's it's um, the release of toxins or of some description through the skin, which is the body's largest organ and the body's, body's largest elimination organ which is why you get all these different spots and rashes and pustules and everything which are called um, given different names again back to different labels you know so it's chicken pox measles um, german measles smallpox all these kinds of skin eruptions are, are given different labels and um, explained away by the medical establishment, of course, as, as being viral or bacterial or something like that, but they're not. They're, they're um, elimination of toxins through the body's um, main organ, and that's yeah. why it often happens in childhood because it's a it's the first or one of the earliest, and, and that's, unless you're going to say otherwise, it's yeah. one of the earliest processes of eliminating toxins. And if they're not eliminated that way, they they build into the body. It, and become more turn into chronic diseases rather than acute diseases. I, mean, they, I know we're I know we're running out of time, but this sort of well, we, it's really up to you guys. I did want to touch. I did want to touch in. That was the one thing I wanted to touch real quick. Is on childhood, uh, so so caused infectious disease like measles. Yeah. That's why I did that. Yeah. Yeah. Chicken box because you were on it. You're <laughs> yeah. so um, okay. We've got. I mean, we're not strict on time. It's more as a as a thing for you guys. But um, yeah. I think this is important to cover because it was recently yes. uh, covered on our Telegram group, and you know, it, people aren't satisfied by the toxicity of the environment answers because for instance, we had measles parties, you know, back in the day and where kids would meet and um, you know, to, to all get the measles out of the way. And we know that it helps with their immune system and everything, but then uh, where's the transference going on there in terms of a germ? Um, yeah, I'll let you guys go first. Well, yeah. there isn't the, the, I mean, one of the things I would suggest that people contemplate is when children get together at parties, they're usually young children, um, look at the kind of foods they would have been eating at their parties. You know, would it be lots of sugar laden, um, uh, sweet type things, confectionaries? Um, uh, they'll get excited. Um, so that, that kind of raises the body's metabolism. And again, that's, you know, leads into free radicals, that kind of thing. So we've got lots of um, possibilities of, of why parties might be the kind of place where children have um, a, a particular experience that encourages that that kind of release of those toxins and the simplest way at, at that age is through the skin so that's why they may have fevers and skin rashes but again it's not every single child um, people say oh well, you know my child went and 
you know, went to the party and got it, but did every single child every single time at all of these parties? And the, the, the answer is no, they don't, because I know from personal experience that that doesn't always happen. Um, One of the things, if I can, because I know we're running out of time, one of the things that people need to consider is where we very first started with this is there is no proof that any germs cause these diseases. So you've got to say, well, what is, you know, there may be a real experience there, but what is it? Because it's not a germ, so you've got to look for something else. And one of the things that people often don't think about, particularly with children, is that the vaccination regime, which is quite heavy, and particularly in America, uh, from a very early age. Now, as we know, those vaccinations are very toxic and there's a large number that children have all around the same time. So groups of children of a similar age are going to be containing similar amounts of toxins, which are going to start coming out at around the same time. And that's a real main factor. I'm keeping this very brief, but it's a real main factor that people need to look at, particularly with these skin eruptions, because as Dawn has already said, that's one of the main ways that the body will seek to get those toxins out. So well, children it, it, of similar age will all experience those similar is, things. Yeah, it is interesting because my kids aren't vaccinated and they haven't had that stuff. And my wife, she just had, um, oh, what is it, uh, bear, um, which is supposedly an aftermath of chicken pox. Oh, shingles. shingles. And, you know, she's pretty hip to this, uh, these ideas and was very lax. And she was actually hoping that her kids would get chicken pox. Uh, it's, um, but they were, nothing happened. And, uh, you know, so that is a great theory uh, or a great idea there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, quick, quick comment. Uh, you know, we're talk. we're back to our word game again. We talk about immunity, the immune system. We don't have an immune system. Correct. The immune Correct. system is not a system that's designed to fight off bad guys. The immune Absolutely. system is a health maintenance system that includes microbes that help keep us healthy. So right off the bat, you know, and we're guilty of that too. You know, we have products and we say strengthen your immunity and everything because we all have to use these words that we're used to. But I know darn well we aren't strengthening immunity. We're actually doing things that uh, just work with biology to keep us healthy. It's yeah. not about keeping the bad guys at bay. Correct. We agree with you entirely. It's, we have a health system. There is a myth about an immune system. It doesn't. The body doesn't work that way. So I'm glad you brought that one up. That's because it's a very interesting point. We're going to have to create a whole new um, terminology, a whole new uh, uh, way of talking, a whole new uh, set of words that describe exactly what we mean rather than trying to use these other yeah, words because, you know, they're, they're traps, just, aren't they? They're yes, traps, they are words. traps, yeah. yes. You know, because there's no such thing as smallpox, measles. And it's what the, uh, it's what the uh, so-called old lineages or elites uh, or whatever people like to call them these days uh, called dog Latin. And it's what was uh, given to the commoners to keep them in a, a, a low-grade superstitious state. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, superstitions play a, a big part in uh, uh, some of the old diseases. Well, th how things started, really. People believing in, in demons attacking them. So then the demons turned into germs. Yeah. And that is exactly. germ theory. That's essentially. Yeah, it's a good, <laughs> yeah, it's a good model. It's worked for centuries. Yeah. <sighs> well, hey, guys. No yeah. um, amazing conversation. Um, I think it's, you know, we're at our over our two hour mark. So we'll do final comments here and wrap it up. Um, any final things to say to our audience, Don and Dave? Uh, well, we obviously we'd encourage people to have a look at our book. We've just got uh, a new website up there, actually, because we, we just had a holding website. So if people go to our new website, which is much more interesting, <laughs> uh, a lot more information, which we'll keep putting on there uh, with articles about the germ theory, about various things, vaccinations, so some interesting stuff, which we'll keep. Uh, so that's a, a good starting point of uh, the various videos. And this one will go up there as well. Um, so uh, yeah, have a look. Uh, do con contemplate buying a book. You'll find it very interesting. You can get it uh, from any Amazon outlet. I know not everyone likes Amazon, but unfortunately they're the publishers. So we're, we're stuck with that. Uh, but any Amazon outlet around the world, you can buy it as a Kindle as well. So, uh, which is obviously quite uh, a lot uh, less expensive. 
Um, it's a big book. It will take a, you know, a couple of weeks to read it, but uh, well worth it. Uh, so its full title is What Really Makes You Ill, or Everything You Thought You Knew About Disease Is Wrong. And I think most people will be quite surprised by the things they see in there. But there are 40 pages of citations, so uh, you'll mm -hmm. be able to see that it's not just our opinion, it's backed up by uh, lots of evidence. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Uh, and uh, Bear, any parting words for our audience today? Uh, just, just thank you. This was a lot of fun. I love you guys. Uh, thank you so much for everything you do. And your book is going to be on the top of my list to recommend to everybody I know. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you thank very you. much. That means and, a lot. Thank and you. speaking of, you can get that book at alpha cast, or excuse me, alphavedic.com forward slash book list, which will actually forward you to our recommended book list on um, the dark evil empire of Amazon. But we do get a little piece of that as a referral. So at least we can um, profit a little bit off them and then use that to in turn create the new world we want to see. So I was uh, battling on doing that or not. And our admins and telegram stuff said, let's just do it. It's really the most universal way people can purchase things, uh, especially books right now. So um, I currently do have the Kindle version. I am putting an order in for the paperback because I am a fan of the paperbacks. So I can thumb through it and take notes and, you know, uh, it really is, seems like it's going to be a reference book for us just to have. So, um, but yeah, please go to alphavedic.com forward slash book list. And we have all the, uh, tons of amazing books. And I'm actually going to add a few today, the American Holocaust, the self-aware universe, and a couple other there, if they're on there. So thank you guys for that. I think that's so important that we continue our education and um, versus, you know, going onto Netflix and watching the propaganda of the latest uh, Bill Gates virus documentary, um, pick up Don and uh, Dave's book and read that instead. Uh, and you'll do your brain a favor too, getting away from the Mesmer TV and, and the mesmerization and, and focusing on uh, working your brain out by actually reading. I know that's a novel idea to many these days. Um, and, and maybe sometime we can have someone narrate it for, uh, you know, for the audio version, because I do enjoy an audio book too, while I'm doing yeah. things. So well, we, uh, we get all sorts, we get all sorts of offers. We've had people want to translate it into all sorts of languages. So uh, uh, yeah, maybe an audio version, maybe on the book, on the cards. But it's interesting that you're going to put it on your book list because uh, it already we is. Have, we, can <laughs> ad, we can advertise that on our site so people can come to you to buy it so, rather oh. than go to Amazon. So that's Wonderful. Good. Appreciate that. Yeah, we've got uh, uh, a lot of amazing books on there. And so check that out. And everybody, thanks so much for joining us today. If you like this, please subscribe on whatever uh, platform you're on. It really helps us hit the like button and leave a comment. Um, and share this with people. We need this information to get out there. Uh, as our guest said today, it really is the time to uh, really spread this information and create the change we want to see. Um, we're all about connecting tri our, you know, different tribes and different uh, online communities, which you can find um, at uh, uh, telegram uh, t.me forward slash alpha, uh, alpha Vedic. So that's t.me forward slash Alpha Vedic. We have an amazing online community there. And then if you just go to alphavedic.com, you can join our mailing list to get updates on future shows, uh, other products. You know, we have, uh, we're selling these grounding bags and we actually have a, port we have the portable grounding bags now on the site. Finally got those up there. So, uh, and a Faraday bag and stuff that you can get to really help protect yourself against these man-made EMFs, 5G, et cetera, as well as our carbon 60 line which is amazing. We now have the black seed carbon 60 and the citrus derived CBD carbon 60 uh, that you can purchase online uh, as well as our Jiao Gulan, which is actually an amazing um, uh, detoxifier as well. The tea of immortality, which we grow on site. So check that all out. And uh, thank you guys again. Thank everybody on the chat. If you do want to join us, we do this every Thursday at 10 AM Pacific standard time on D live dlive.tv forward slash alpha Vedic. And then we premiere it on YouTube at 5 p.m. So thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Get outside. Get your hands dirty. Get in nature. Go for a hike. Do what you need to do to, uh, to really uh, enjoy your life, I would say, is the most important thing. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.